مسلم قرآن اسمك I hear the calling of them With it we unite We are special only If we follow his light The way of Muhammad Calling to paradise Ya Allah, Ya Allah We are your servants, Ya Allah بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Over the last two episodes we talked we chattered about a number of things, mainly why the Ummah is under this humiliation, why are the Muslims so way back from where they're supposed to be. And we came to the conclusion that the reason is that we are far away from our religion, from our actual Islam. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ prophesied this 15 centuries ago when he clearly told us that his ummah, his nation, will be divided into 73 sects. 72 of them will go straight to hell, and only one would be saved. Now, without going into extreme detail, about these 72, instead of identifying them and trying to label sects and divisions as such, it would be more convenient to identify the saved sect. What are the, what their beliefs and convictions are. So this is better than taking the long way, we take the shortest way between two points, which is a straight line, and maintain being on that straight path or straight line. So we will briefly, again, chatter, chit-chat, about some of the basics that I claim that no Muslim can go against. They're so logical, they're so obvious, that even those deviant sects would not have the audacity to come up and say, no, this is not acceptable. They have to. They must agree upon them, because these are the basics, the essence of Islam. And it's not all of it, but by going through it and just contemplating on it, you and I can relate whether we are on the straight path, whether we are on the path of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions or not. So first of all, what is the source of aqidah? What is the source of our conviction, of our creed, of our belief? No doubt in the minds of any Muslim that the sole source of what we believe is the Quran, the Sunnah, and the consensus of the companions, the Tabi'een, and the Tabi'it Tabi'een. These are the three preferred generations which the Prophet ﷺ highlighted to us. So ask any deviant sect no matter what sect that is, and tell them, can you take your creed other from the Qur'an and the Sunnah? If they said, yes, we can take it from our awliya, we can take it from our uh, righteous people, we can take it from the grave, we can take it, then you know that this is not related to Islam. 
So just put this at the back of your mind and always contemplate on it to be able to identify the path of the Prophet ﷺ. Secondly, everything that is in the Qur'an is our creed, is our sharia, is our law. So there's no dispute in this. No one dares to come and say, um, yes, but this topic in the Qur'an, no, it's, it's not right. Maybe it was suitable at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Maybe it was suitable uh, centuries ago, but now this is inapplicable, and hence we cannot accept this. This is total blasphemy. Anyone who rejects anything from the Qur'an is an apostate. He's not a Muslim. No matter what the justification is. And also, anything that is authentic from the Sahih Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, then we must accept it. We must embrace it. Unfortunately, nowadays you come with gimmicks. You see people claiming to be scholars or students of knowledge and their sole purpose is to reject the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Because the sunnah completes and explains and elaborates on the Qur'an. Without the sunnah, Qur'an by itself cannot tell you what to do and what not to do in the holistic way of Islam. It tells you to pray, but it doesn't tell you how many prayers, how many rak'ahs per each prayer, what's the format, what to read and what not to do. It tells you how to, it tells you to give zakat, but it doesn't tell you the percentage. It can be 2.5, it can be 5%, it can be 10%, it can be without any percentage, but rather from the number of cattle, etc. So, you need the sunnah. These people with deviant intentions come and try to undermine the sunnah. So they cast doubts. Oh, we don't know if this hadith is sahih or not sahih. This is not your job. There are scholars who know this. You as a layman cannot tell if you have a brain tumor or not. This is the job of a brain neurosurgeon. Likewise in hadith, there are scholars of hadith. Their speciality is hadith. They can tell us, they can filter to us what is can, uh, authentic and what is not. So they came with another gimmick. They said that oh, there are hadith that are mutawatir and there are hadith that are ahad. And this is a little bit technical, but when the layman hears this from someone who speaks with authority and confidence, said he should know what he's talking about. So he says, Ahad, we do not accept this. What is the meaning of Ahad? Ahad is a technical word to relate that the narration of the Hadith does not go to more than three or, or so of narrators in each level. So by, by this definition, which is very rough definition, it's not very technical because this is not a technical program, uh, it, by this definition, you would throw away 97% of the hadiths, or maybe more, because the majority of hadiths are ahad. They're authentic. But for example, the hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ It's an ahad. Only Umar narrated it. Though there are a number of different levels and narrators in the levels of the uh, 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 chain of narrators, but Omar was the only one, so this is Ahad. So those deviants may reject it if they don't like it, because it goes against their whims and desires. As Muslims, whatever is in the Quran is our shara. Whatever comes from the Prophet ﷺ and is authentic, we accept it without any questions asked, even if it was Ahad. Ibn al-Qayyim has a very beautiful statement. He says in one of his books, I was talking once 
with one of these deviants who reject the hadith of Ahad. And I said to him, if the Prophet ﷺ were to come and would order us to do something, and not a lot of people heard this, he addressed us alone. Would you think that we're obliged to obey him? The man said, definitely yes. This is a straight order from the Prophet ﷺ. So we cannot reject it. We cannot manipulate it with our whims and desires. And we have to accept it as it is. The man said, yes. So Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on his soul, said to the man, then what went wrong? And why isn't this being applied by you and your followers? What had changed? The instruction of the Prophet ﷺ is crystal clear. It's authentic. It's here. Why aren't you embracing it? He said the man was speechless. And likewise, all these innovators, deviants, sects and cults and groups, when they reject the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is authentic, acknowledge that they are deviant and that they should not be listened to or even followed. Whenever we have verses of the Qur'an or the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, what is our reference in understanding it? The reference is, without any doubt, the other verses of the Qur'an and the hadiths. See, it's one of the biggest mistake, and you would agree with me, I hope, that when you find the verse of the Qur'an, to understand it or to try to understand it in isolation from all of the rest of the Qur'an. This is totally unacceptable. Wouldn't you agree? If someone comes to a verse of the Qur'an and chops it in half, where Allah says, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ This is a verse by itself. Allah says, woe to those who pray. If someone comes and says, Alhamdulillah, it is difficult for me to wake up early in the morning for Fajr, but now Allah is telling, telling us, woe to those who pray, therefore I'm not going to pray. Would this understanding be acceptable to you and I? I know for certain that your answer is be no. He has to complete the ayah or to look at the interpretation of the ayah from other ayat, from other verses. Allah says, woe to those who pray, those who neglect or forsake or leave their prayers. So they are worshippers in the sense that they are not frequent. They, are, they pray, but off and on, or on and off. This is where Allah is calling them, is reprimanding them, is threatening them with a valley in hellfire. So therefore, you have to understand the Qur'an in light of the other verses of the Qur'an because it's holistic. It all goes side by side. Nothing opposes. No way you find a, an ayah uh, uh, um, conflicting with another ayah. The conflict is in your head, not in the Qur'an because this is revealed from Allah the Almighty. This is Allah's speech. Likewise, in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, it is impossible to understand it except in the light of the hadith and the teaching of the Prophet himself ﷺ. So if we have the Qur'an and we have the Sunnah, we can understand them by looking at them, studying them well, in the light of the understanding of the righteous predecessors. Because you cannot reinvent the wheel. The best people who understood the Qur'an and the Sunnah were the closest to the Prophet ﷺ. Those who spoke the language of the Qur'an on their, in their homes, in the markets, in their daily routine. This was their language. Unlike us today, we speak uh, uh, local Arabic, which is 
a distortion of the real Fusha Arabic. So you cannot understand the Quran and the Sunnah except through the understanding of the companions. So if the companion tells us that the interpretation of this ayah is so and so, and some maulana or some student of knowledge or scholar says, no, this is not correct. According to Arabic, it means so and so. We tell this brother, sit down, relax, take off your shoes and take a nap. It's much better for the Muslim ummah. Because you're an imbecile. Now, having said that, we must follow the Quran and the Sunnah through or in the light of the understanding of our righteous predecessors. Now, the fundamentals of deen, the fundamentals of Islam that we must embrace, that we must accept, has been clarified to us by the Prophet ﷺ without any doubt. So everything we need in this religion has been shown to us by the Prophet ﷺ. And no one is excused, no one has the right to invent, to innovate, to add or subtract anything of Islam. Allah Azza wa Jal clearly stated in the Quran in chapter 5. Is it chapter 5? Yes, in chapter 5, verse 3. Allah clearly says, This day I have perfected for you your religion and completed my favor upon you and have approved you Islam as a religion. So if Allah perfected the religion when this ayah was revealed, do you agree with me that no one can come and say or introduce something today by saying this is Islam or this is part of Islam which was not at the time of the Prophet ﷺ? These are basics. These are logical things. Contemplate upon it. Something that the Prophet ﷺ did not worship Allah with. Nor the Prophet indicated to us that there is a room of maneuver. Nor the companions had done this at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Can anyone claim that this is righteous, this is good, you can get closer to Allah by doing this? Though the Prophet did not ﷺ teach us this, contemplate. If your answer is yes, in this case, you are following the Sunnah. But if your answer is no, we can introduce something, we can bring something, we can innovate something, then you have a problem because you're not a true Muslim. Whatever was not at the time of the Prophet ﷺ a form of worship cannot be now a form of worship because this is innovation as Allah Azza wa Jal had stated that the religion is complete and perfect. No way you can add anything to it. Now one would says, you Sheikh, you're using uh, um, a PDA. You're using a car. Akhi, we're talking about forms of worship. Do you see me making iqama before using my tablet? Do you see me uh, giving adhan before riding my car? These are normal things that people invent in their lives. We talk about what you do and perform to get closer to Allah Azza wa in terms of ibadah. I'm told that we have a short break, but we still have a number of points to discuss. So if there were no calls afterwards, we will continue. Otherwise, we will postpone this until tomorrow, inshallah. So stay tuned. <laughs> the most common name in the world. Why were so many parents interested and still are interested in naming the children Muhammad? What are examples of his love, his compassion, his mercy, his dedication, his sincerity, his bravery? How did he balance between private life and the public sphere of life? Why is he known as the greatest mercy sent to humankind? 
Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, join us as we learn more about the balanced and beautiful personality of perfection. Yeah, yeah, Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Now, part of the basics that we must believe in is that no one claiming to be Muslim has the right not to submit his will, not to to surrender to Allah's orders and to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam inside out do you agree with me so if Allah tells you to do something or his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells you to do something can any Muslim say mm, let me think or no, I don't think uh, I'll, I'll do that. I think I'll pass. Can any Muslim out of choice do this? If the instruction to us comes from Allah, if the prohibition comes to us from Allah, and likewise from the Prophet والسلام, no one can use his analogy to refute or reject that. No one is allowed to use his own whims or taste or claim that he saw a vision or a, night, uh, or, or a dream or one of his peers or one of his awliya or shiyukh told him otherwise. This is basic. This is common knowledge to any Muslim. Allah tells you something, you've got to comply. And this is why Imam Shafi'i, may Allah have mercy on him, was outraged when he was saying that, and the ruling of this is so and so because Allah Azza wa Jal said, and the Prophet said, والسلام, and he quoted the evidences. So one in his congregation stood up and said, okay, Imam, what do you say? And he was outraged. He said, do you see me coming out of a synagogue or out of a church? Do you see in my waist there is a rope like the monks coming from monasteries? Where? Do you think I'm, I'm, I'm Christian? Or I'm telling you Allah says, and the Prophet ﷺ says, and you say, what do you say? Do you think I'm going to go against them? And this is basic knowledge. This is so 
easy that even children know that. Now, all of this, put it in the back of your mind and ask yourself a question. Am I like this or am I going against these basics? I'll give you a very easy example. Now, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, it is not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment to travel without a mahram. It's in black and white, very clear, very easy to understand. How many women implement and apply this hadith? And those who go against the hadith, what is their justification? The majority of them say, yes, I know this hadith and it's authentic, but Imam so-and-so says it's okay. Sheikh so-and-so says if you are in a group of women, this is okay. Sheikh, uh, uh, another school of thought said this and that. So is this a sign of us being true Muslims, following our Prophet ﷺ? We are rejecting what he's ordering us with, in a blink of an eye, which means that if we were to be at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, most likely we would have been among the hypocrites. Because today, it's well proven fact that we go against whatever he teaches sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Amber Fusadia. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu Um Sheikh, I have, um, I have uh, three questions. Um, the first one is, um, I want to confirm, like, uh, is it true that um, in Ramadan, like, they're, we divide it into uh, three ashabas, first, second, and third, uh, last, and days? And for each of the ashabas, we have... Uh, like, your, line, your line is breaking, Amber. Um, okay, I got your first question. Yeah, I mean, is there a type of offer we can touch on, like, first is for, um, this one? No, 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 it's, it's, it's unaudible. I cannot hear you at all. Please uh, call again, if possible. Okay, uh, Amber's question, uh, we will answer, inshallah, uh, uh, until she gives us another call. There is a famous hadith circulating that Ramadan, the first of it is mercy, the second of it, the second third of it is forgiveness, and the last third of it is uh, uh, freedom from hellfire. But this hadith is not authentic. So again, we go back to the basics. We cannot accept any hadith unless those professionals, those specialists of hadith tell us that this is authentic. So they give us a green light, then we contemplate and try to study that hadith and implement it. If not, then it's a no-show. We cannot take this hadith. Unfortunately, people are circulating this hadith. <coughs> not only that, they say that this dua is to be said in the first 10 days of Ramadan and another dua in the second 10 days of the Ramadan and a third dua for the last 10 days of Ramadan and some even go a little bit further by saying that you have to say this a number of times a given number of times and some go even an extra mile by saying that if you do this then this will happen and this and this and this and this and you get pages and pages on WhatsApp or on Facebook or in Twitter, people claiming that this has been practiced, this been, has been the advice of Sheikh so-and-so, and you should do it, and it's all baseless, and it has no foundation to it at all. Therefore, one should not uh, participate in that. I hope that uh, uh, Amber calls back for the remaining two questions of hers. Now, part of the basics, again, a question. Is Islam and the rulings that we are ordered to do or the prohibitions that we are ordered to stay away from and refrain, are they logical or not? 
Now, this is a tricky question, simply because logic is not something that you can measure. And it's not something that is fixed. A lot of factors influence logic. So your feelings, the environment, what you want, the way you perceive things, the way you look at them, which angle, all of these influence logic. So it would be fair to say that logic differs from one person to the other. But, and this is a second conclusion that logic does not lead. Logic follows. So as Muslims, our basic belief states that we give precedent, we give a priority to what is known as a naql which translates roughly to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The evidences of the two revelations, Qur'an and the Sunnah. We give them the priority and we claim that logic which is sound and correct cannot go against them. Having said that, in Islam there are things that are logical to all humans. So this is part of logic. For example, when we say that consuming intoxicants is haram, nobody disagrees with this in the proper logic. So if you go to someone who drinks alcohol and you tell him that Islam prohibits it, says, this is not logical, I like to drink. So we tell him, go ahead and drink. And he drinks until he's wasted. Then we film him after being wasted, maybe urinating in a bowl, then washing himself with his urine, doing stupid things, cursing, things that are unacceptable. Then we show it to him. He would say, gee, I didn't know that this was bad, that bad. He, his logic changes because now he's looking to it from a different perspective. We will continue this later on, inshallah. We have Noura from UAE. Yes, assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I was widow last year, and uh, the court uh, ruled the money of my husband, uh, his pension, to give my son. Three, my son is three years old. And uh, they, the court gave 1,000 monthly allowance for his uh, expenses, uh, basic expenses. And uh, uh, my question is, uh, if I get, uh, if I use uh, some of uh, that money, the 1,000 monthly allowance, if I get for myself some, something like that, and uh, is it haram for me? I am getting a, a money that is uh, only enough for, ba for my basic. But because I mix my money and uh, my son's money, the 1,000, and I'm afraid that I get some of that because sometimes he spend less of that. Uh, of that, uh, um, sometimes he will spend more if, like, if I buy him uh, toys and clothes. He's three years old. You don't get any pe any pension for yourself. For myself, I get, but it's also uh, a little. It's just only enough for my basic. And you work? No, I don't work. Uh, but you're able to live with, with both? Yes, yes, uh, I'm able to live with that. Okay, I will answer, inshallah. But, but, but because the bank send the 1,000 monthly for my boy uh, to my account, so the money is mixed, and uh, uh, I'm not able to calculate all the expenses for my son, like the rice we pay have or uh, anything, etc., like that. Okay, so, I, will answer uh, I will answer you, I will answer you, inshallah. Yes, and I have another question. Uh, if I pray uh, Taraway and with, uh, in, with, uh, in Masjid, can I pray? in the house. Okay. I will answer okay. you. Okay. Uh, Amber? Yes, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Salam to Allah. Uh, I hope the sound is better. Now. Yes, it's much better. Okay, Sheikh. I can ask you questions on uh, any topic or just the one that you are discussing? <laughs> Nobody asks on the uh, topic we are discussing. All the questions are way away from this topic. 
So feel free to ask whatever you want. Okay, actually, I have many, many queries. I'll be calling you, inshallah. I'm watching your show with uh, regularly. Okay. Um, my uh, question is now, Sheikh, that um, uh, yesterday you were talking about the Ambar, Ambar, your, your line is breaking again. What, what's wrong with your questions? It's um, I w no, okay, now it's okay. Uh, I want to know about the names of Allah that we name our kids with, you know, like Rahman, Rahim. Uh, how, what is the ruling on naming uh, kids with after Allah's name? Or, um, okay. Uh, and uh, um, is it is it um, um, does it matter? Like I mean, I've heard that uh, uh, my son's name is Muhammad, and uh, because he used to be very sick at birth and um, as as a kid, so people told me if you change the name, the name affects a person. Also, uh, it will um, have better effects on its health. It's, does that make any sense? Um, according to Sharia. Okay. Any, and, uh, any more questions? Another question is, uh, like, is it okay to write MA or IA, like, on social media? People use the short forms for mashallah and inshallah and all that. Okay. Yes. Any more questions? Hello? Okay, I think we've lost Amber. Um, Nora has been a widow for a year now, alhamdulillah, may Allah have mercy on her husband's soul. And she gets a thousand dirham from the pension of her son. And she gets also something extra, but the money is deposited in her bank account. And she says that sometimes the expenses of the boy is less than a thousand. So I may use that for the household, for myself, is this a, a problem? Usually it is a problem, but in your case it's not. Why is that? Because the pension that you get for him is supposed to be also paid on the rent, the electricity, the phone bills, and the food. So it's not only his food or his uh, um, toys or whatever, even his education. So whatever comes, he requires much more than a thousand and you're definitely paying more than that uh, uh, from your own money and from your own pension. And therefore I think it's uh, um, permissible for you to put it all together and use it for the house because it's not only for you, it's for you and him as well. Fatima from Saudi. Salam to Allah. Sheikh, I have one question. Yes. Okay, the first day of Ramadan, we intended to fast and um, we wake up uh, at the time when we had the Azan. When we had the Azan, we wake up and we ate. After eating now, I was ready to drink some water. I had the Ibama from the mosque. And I didn't know why they did not make two azan that day. So I don't know whether my fasting for that day is valid or not. So you thought that the adhan you heard was the first adhan, which yes, does not... Yes, Wallah, I thought it was the first azan. Okay, any more questions? No, only this question. I will answer you, inshallah. Okay. Uh, Nora from the Emirates, second question, that... A lot of the Muslims ask about and I'll briefly tell you the answer and how to look at it so that you don't need to ask again inshallah the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam make the last of your night prayer witter now this is a recommendation or an order it can be this it can be that he also said there are no two witters in the same night meaning this is prohibited to offer one witter in the beginning and then offer another one in the middle or at the end. And the Prophet والسلام, the third evidence, he used to offer witr and then pray afterwards two rak'ahs sitting down. Which means that it is not prohibited to pray after offering one witr. You can pray afterwards by the doing of the Prophet والسلام. From these evidences, 
we get the answer to the frequently asked question. If I pray taraweeh in the masjid with the imam, the imam prays eight rak'ahs, then he offers three rak'ahs with her. So now I've prayed 11 rak'ahs, or I prayed 23 rak'ahs, depending on the number of rak'ahs the imam offers. Then I go back home, and an hour or, or so before fajr, I love to pray tahajjud. So can I pray two rak'ahs, two rak'ahs, two rak'ahs, and then witr? Or must I refrain because I offered witr in the beginning? From the evidences I have mentioned to you earlier, you can pray as many two rak'ahs as you wish, and you must not repeat a second witr because the one you've done with the taraweeh, with the imam, is sufficient for you, and you must not do anything else. So I hope this answers your uh, question. We have uh, Sister Humaira. Humaira? Yeah. You are from? Yeah, Kiasi. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu uh, Ramadan Mubarak. And to you as well. Zakallah khair. Yeah. Actually, I have three questions. Yes. Uh, my first question is regarding homeopathic medicine, as there is alcohol in it. I want to know if uh, there are certain conditions in which it can be used, like in some, for some diseases, there are many side effects. So, uh, if I know of some good doctor, can I refer uh, others to him? That okay. is my question. Uh, because he can treat uh, chronic cases as well. And uh, another question is regarding the uh, pictures and sculptures which are forbidden to uh, keep at home. I want to know if uh, the TV is going on in, in the room or somebody is using mobile, in which pictures are there. C can I offer uh, prayer in that room? Yani, I have doubt. Okay. Yani, is, is it, uh, does it have anything to do with the pictures, TV or um, books? Yani, uh, pictures in the books, if they are kept open, Yani, I have such doubts while uh, praying, so I want... Uh, okay, so third yeah. question? Yeah, third question is uh, uh, regarding, Yani, um, uh, in schools, uh, uh, sometimes uh, they give uh, papers in which in the name of Allah is written, and sometimes in, uh, Yani, like, uh, so such papers, can I uh, give them for recycling or just I keep them at home? Like what, ki what kind of papers are you being given? I did not like, understand. Like uh, there is a subject Islamic education or in the exams, uh, in the first page they write in the name of Allah like that. In Arabic? No, no, in English. So you, uh, your question is, shall I yani, destroy this because you're afraid of being it humiliated? Yes, yes. Uh, because uh, uh, here in KSA, uh, 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 yani, outside the masjid there are some boxes for pa papers. Okay. Recycling, maybe. So, can I uh, uh, put those papers uh, for recycling, or just I keep them at home because uh, I'm afraid of uh, um, such things. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Um, not now. Inshallah, maybe later. Inshallah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. You're Thank quite you. welcome. Um, Amber had a number of questions. She is asking about the names of Allah Azza wa Jal that we are allowed and permitted to use with our children. And this causes a lot of confusion. The names of, of Allah Azza wa Jal are divided into two types. Names that can only be used for Allah Azza wa Jal. So Allah the Almighty is Allah. You cannot call someone Allah, except Allah Azza wa Jal. And you, for example, cannot call someone Rahman. So his name is Abd Rahman. Sometimes you get people calling him Ya Rahman. This is not permissible at all. Ya Khaliq, creator. This is only for Allah Azza wa Jal, and so on. There are names that share the same attribute with of course no similarities so Allah Azza wa Jal is a Sami' al Basir, all hearing and all seeing and Allah says in Surah Al-Insan that he created man and he made him hearing and seeing not only that Allah Azza wa Jal is the wise 
الحكيم العليم but also man can be wise and can be knowledgeable if you look for one of the great names of Allah Al Aziz and this is mentioned hundreds of times in the Quran but we also find in Surah Yusuf that the ruler or a position in the government was Al Aziz Ya Ayyuhal Al Aziz they are calling their brother Yusuf who assumed that position so this shows you that there are names that you cannot call humans with and there are names that is permissible to do that and Allah Azza wa knows best she asks about the ruling on changing the names so sometimes a child is born and he's afflicted by many illnesses so people come and say change his name if the name itself is a good name then this is superstitions and one must not rely or even listen to such things but if the name itself is bad you know some some names have bad meanings to them and they're inappropriate then changing the name would be an advisable thing because the name that is bad should be changed whether a child is sick or not the Prophet Alaihissalam's habit was to change any name that had a bad uh, uh, meaning to it the third question on social media sometimes they abbreviate Masha Allah into MA or inshallah God willing into IA so uh, sometimes also they say assalamu alaikum AA and so many things is this appropriate answer is no such abbreviations are not uh, appropriate I would not say it's haram but it is inappropriate one should try to avoid it and if it comes to Islamic terminology such as uh, peace be upon him and this uh, right abbreviation that you know P-U-B-M or uh, P-U-B-H or whatever so this is again not appropriate even in Arabic some people abbreviate Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam into Saad between brackets and scholars say that this is not uh, appropriate Fatima says that she and her husband and her family know that the masjid offers two adhans for Fajr and this is the Sunnah by the way which is still uh, uh, being practiced in Mecca and Medina and some other cities around the world but unfortunately the majority of cities in Saudi Arabia do not implement it and this shows you how deviated a bit from the Sunnah we are this is the Sunnah of the Prophet Ibn Ummi Maktoum used to give the second Adhan Bilal used to give the first Adhan and the Prophet said when Bilal gives the Adhan you may still eat and drink it's not Fajr time yet but this is a reminder to wake those who are asleep and to bring the attention of those who are praying that Fajr is drawing near but when Ibn Ummi Maktoum announces the Adhan then you should refrain so Fatima thought that the first the adhan they heard and woke up to was the first adhan. So they ate and she wanted to drink. And just before she drank, she heard the iqama. So now she is devastated. She feels betrayed in a sense. And she's afraid what to do with the day that she thinks was invalid fasting. The answer is your fasting is valid your fasting is intact because you did not know and this is from Allah's favor and blessing upon us that this day is counted in and there is no problem with it Humaira is ask, asking about homopathy uh, medication which includes a lot of percentage of um, uh, alcohol in it and it serves to help those with chronic illnesses and lots 
of pains. So what's the uh, uh, verdict on it? If it intoxicates, then it's prohibited because it's not being used for its healing uh, um, characteristics, characteristics, but rather to their pain relieving uh, uh, attributes through being intoxicated. And the most authentic opinion that these types of medications are not permissible. They have more harm than good. And the Prophet ﷺ was asked about wine and being used and being sold. And he said, the Prophet ﷺ, that it is prohibited. One says, we use it as a medication. And he said, it's not a medication. It's an illness by itself and therefore you should not refer anyone to that doctor her second question about statues and sculptures is television or watching a video on your laptop or uh, a phone the same thing the answer is no this is totally different the sculptures people imitate the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal, while videos is just capturing the uh, 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 the structure, the, the, the creation of Allah. So what you see on your TV screens is the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal. It's not something that people had done. Um, the third question, the names of Allah Azza wa Jal that are found or are written other than Arabic do not have the same sacred status of the Arabic. So if we have a paper with, with the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, etc. In Arabic, it has to be disposed of properly by putting it in a paper shredder, by uh, burning it, by burying it, by giving it to the boxes near the masjid so they can burn it. But if it's written in God, or the name is Abdul Aziz in English, this has not, does not have the same sacred status as in Arabic, and Allah Azza wa knows best. And until we meet you tomorrow, same time, I leave you in the name of Allah, and peace be upon you, and peace be upon you. I am a Muslim, the Quran is my guide. I hear the calling of them, with it we unite. We are special only, if we follow his light, the way Calling to paradise Ya Allah, Ya Allah We are your servants, Ya Allah La ilaha illallah Muhammad